Hello, hello. Welcome back to another episode of Minority Reports podcast and digital series. I am your host, Mona Sheikh. So nice. It's so nice to be here. It's Friday, TGIF. It's Labor Day weekend, everybody. Happy Labor Day, Labor Day weekend. I hope you guys have something really fun planned for this weekend. I am going to be, um, I'm trying to contemplate between uh, organizing my paperwork. I absolutely despise organizing paperwork. I mean, to my core, I hate it. Um, but I'm trying to take some time out this weekend to actually organize my paperwork and um, possibly make a road trip, just a road trip on Sunday. I'm uh, planning. I don't know if it's going to happen, but I'm planning it. So here I am uh, trying to make stuff happen uh, over the weekend. What are your plans? Let me know. Type in your in the box. What are you guys doing this Labor Day weekend? Maybe there's some ideas you can suggest to me. I was thinking about making a day trip out to Santa Barbara because I love going to Santa Barbara. And uh, that's literally one of my favorite favorite spots to go to. So I would love to hear your comments. So if you can uh, put in some comments and let me know what you guys are doing uh, for the weekend and maybe possibly suggest some places that I could go to and uh, that would be nice. Uh, let me tell you something. A lot of people think, you know, a lot of people, married people think like single people are just out there, just like partying. And I was just thinking about my life. Like I'm going to do this. Then I have another sh- like show to do after this online, of course. Uh, and then I'm going to be taking my dog for a poop walk. Okay. That is the single life. And then I'm going to come home, eat something, maybe smoke some weed and then go to sleep. That is my entire existence, you guys. So uh, I know a lot of married people think that single people just are just out there just getting their hands on as much ass as they possibly can. And that is not the case. I wish it was, especially during the pandemic. I am not bringing um, COVID dick home. I'm just not, I'm not getting COVID dick. Like it's just, it's just not happening guys. So I am uh, just going to be, you know, taking my dog for a walk and uh, cleaning things up and uh, yay for single life. Um, but today, uh, enough about, uh, enough about uh, walking the dog in the single life. I have a very special guest who's going to be coming on shortly, uh, whom I am very excited to have on. Uh, she is in, um, She's a sex. Uh, she's a sex writer. She's an accidental sex writer, and the best part is she's South Asian. So that's not something you would get to see among South Asian women uh, being sex writers as often as we would like to, uh, mainly because of the um, culture, called conservative cultural, um, I guess, uh, boundaries that are put on women to not talk about sex. The uh, India, or you know. Uh, the the land of Kama Sutra, people don't want to talk about sex. Fascinating. Uh, absolutely fascinating. Um, so we are going to have our guest who's going to be coming on soon. I am very, very excited to have her on. But I would love to hear what your thoughts are about this weekend and what you guys are up to. Uh, that is always uh, one of my uh, favorite things to do. Um, I am uh, waiting for her, um, for our guest to come on. Um, and, uh, I want to know what you guys are up to. I, uh, was reading up about our guest who's going to be coming on and she had this one crazy story that she went on a date with this British guy. He had a fancy British accent and, uh, she was, uh, he, she's an American and she's a man, you know, born and raised here. And actually born in Canada, raised in the U.S. And she went on a date with this guy. And this guy kept ordering expensive things. He ordered a $148 bottle of wine, which she didn't want. She just wanted one glass of wine. He was like, no, no, no. We'll have like two glasses of wine each. And she was like, no, that's not really necessary. Then the guy is just like, oh, I'm really hungry. Let's order some food. And she was like, you know, I really didn't want to meet you for dinner. I just wanted to have some snacks and just kind of get to know you. And then he's like, oh, no, 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 no. Oh, you want dessert? Let's order dessert. And she was like, no, I don't. I don't really want to order dessert. Um, You know, I just want to I just want to, like, talk to you, get to know you and just then just head out, you know. And the guy's like, no, 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 we'll do this. And the bill arrived and he insisted that he pay the bill. And it was two hundred and nine dollars for dinner for first time meeting on Tinder. It was a Tinder day. OK, so she was like, oh, my God, uh, then. She's like, all right, you know, thank you so much. And I'm going to go head home now. And he's like, no, 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 
let me walk you to the subway station. And she's like, Jesus Christ, I can't seem to freaking get rid of this guy. So she walks, he walks her to the, uh, to the train station. And as they're walking towards the train station, he sees this bar that he was telling her about. And, um, and by the way, the, the date was not a fun date. It was a horrible date because he just kept talking about himself the entire freaking time. I hate that shit. I've been on dates like that where the guy just talks about himself. He doesn't give a shit about you. He doesn't ask you a single question about you. He has no interest in getting to know you. All he does is talk about me, 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 I, 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 I. And you're just like being nice. And you're like, yeah, sure, that guy. Um, but, um, and I, I, our guest has signed in. So I'm going to have our guest tell her story herself because I think she can tell her story better than I can. Um, this wonderful entrepreneur, storyteller, speaker, and accidental sex writer, as she likes to call herself, Rachel Kona is here. Rachel, welcome. Hi. Hi, how are you? Good. What's going on? I was, uh, reading your story and I was just telling our audience, uh, about the story of, uh, the guy sending you an invoice. I was reading your blog, the guy sending you an invoice after. And I, when I read it, I was, I was laughing and I was angry at the same time. It has an effect on people. Yeah. I wanted to like, I wanted to be like, Oh my God, Rachel. And then turn around and like punch him in the face. Like I had like those feelings simultaneously uh, because I've been there. I've been there with a guy who pretended like he forgot his wallet. And then he was like, pick up the tab. Oh, see, that's not cool. I'm, well, do you know for sure that he pretended? He, he definitely forgot it. it. Yeah, no. he definitely forgot it. Yeah, he definitely forgot it. But I, I made him pay. I made him pay, though. Oh, okay, good. That's yeah. Good. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, welcome. Okay, but then he invoiced me. Unbelievable. <laughs> so I was towards the tail end of the story of uh, you, he, him walking you to the subway station and talent pointing out this bar saying, oh, this is the bar I was telling you about. Why don't you come to the bar? And you were like, no, I'm just going to go home. Uh -huh. And then um, then you joined in. So I would rather you finish the story. Okay. Well, uh, I feel like I'm off center. There you are. Yeah. Right. Um. Yeah. So basically the date wasn't going well at all. Like he was kind of like just mansplaining to me the whole time and like insisting on ordering more and more food. And I kept saying I wasn't hungry and... He ordered a really expensive bottle of wine. Um, and during the date, he had mentioned some bar. And I was just kind of like, all right, whatever. Like, And after it was over, I was just like, I need to get out of here. I was like, get me the subway. Yeah. So I'm kind of like speed walking the subway. And he's like, I'll walk you. And I was like, oh, I'm fine. But he insisted on walking me. And um, we passed this bar that he was speaking about. And he's like, oh, there it is. He's like, come on. You said you would go. And I'm like. Do you, like you clearly have no concept of social interaction with humans period much less a woman just like anybody like just not picking up on, on social cues or like the fact that I just wasn't interested and I had said no I didn't want to go and mm -hmm. um you know I kept saying no and he got mad about it he was just like but you promise and he was kind of being like a crybaby about it like saying it like that and I was just like I do not I have the time, the energy, and I, I don't care. So oh, wow. <laughs> I was just like, I'm leaving. So I just walked to the subway. And yeah. the moment I got out of the subway, there was a text from him saying that he had a great time. I was like, oh my God. <laughs> wow. Desperado. Desperado much? Yeah. Desperado and crazy. Cuckoo. Totally cuckoo. Yeah. Um. All right, we're gonna, um, well, welcome. Uh, thank you for uh, sharing and finishing off that story. You are uh, someone who was born in Canada and then raised in Jersey, correct? Correct. Now, where in Jersey were you raised? I went to high school in Jersey City. Oh, okay, North Jersey. Mm -hmm. um, I'm actually from South Jersey near Philadelphia, like 20 minutes away from there. So anyone who knows Jersey knows, we tend to think of it as like two different states. Yes. Two warring factions of like North and South. Yes. Yes. North and South tends to be a, a, a lot different now. And I mean, so uh, are you still in, on the East Coast? Where are you? I'm in the Bay Area now. You're in the Bay Area now. Okay. Yeah. And now um, I was reading up about you, about how you accidentally became a sex writer 
So please do tell, like you didn't walk down the path of becoming an engineer or a doctor. You didn't have parents who were like, you got to do this. And you were like, no, I'm going to write about sex, mom and dad. Like, how did that go down? Um, yeah, I didn't quite break it to the mail like that. But, um, you know, I, everyone kept telling me to be a writer. Like all my friends um, were like, you know, you should be a writer. My, even my mom was like, oh, you used to write a lot as a kid. Um, and I never took it seriously. And then one day uh, I just had like a break from work. We had like a two week vacation because of the holidays, like Christmas and New Year's, we used to shut down. And so I didn't have any plans. And I was like, I guess I'll start writing. So I started writing. Fast forward, um, you know, my old boss read it. I had a few friends read some of the things I wrote of their own volition. I didn't ask them to read it. They actually asked me to read it. And everyone was like, you're super funny. You should, you know, keep going with this. And so I started freelancing. Um, the thing is, I like to write things that are funny. And uh, there's really no room for that in like Condé Nast Traveler or, you know, um, I think like more serious things like that. Um, mm -hmm. I was going to say like the New York Times, but I've written some New York Times. But it, generally speaking, like where the, the, the sections that are, are more humorous are the, the sex dating related sure. um, sort of genre. So that's kind of why I call it accidental because I wasn't trying to only write about that. I actually have funny stories about other things, but there's nowhere to really put that other than like my own blog. So got it. Yeah. Got it. And, uh, and did you, did your parents insist that you go to school to become a doctor or an engineer Did you kind of go through that kind of, because you are of Indian descent. So, yeah. uh, you know, we South Asian kids, we have yeah. that with our parents. Uh, what was that like for you? Yeah, I remember like telling my mom when I was like, she's a doctor and my dad's an engineer. So there you, there you have it. Um, <laughs> they covered those grounds. Yeah, exactly. Um, so when I was younger, I remember telling my mom, like, I don't think I want to have a job where I wear a suit, like when I grow up or whatever. And she was like, what are you going to do? Me? Like, a, like a, I don't want a job shame, but this was back in the day and a South Asian parent. But she was like, well, what are you going to be, a janitor? And like, there was, it, those were the options. It was right. like doctor or something very serious that would require a suit or, you know. A lawyer, maybe? A lawyer. Yeah, but I didn't want to do any of that. So she, like, I, nothing with, like, a suit or nothing, like, serious. And she used to wear a suit to work. Not that doctors are required to, but she just, like, but it was just very, like, binary. There was nothing in between that was, like, you know, maybe you can do something you like and not wear a suit. Right. Um, and that just, like, really stuck in my head. So they were, like... They realized I was actually really bad at science, like really bad. And so they kind of didn't push that as much, but they were kind of hoping I would do finance or do law. Um, and I thought about it, but then I wanted to do human rights law. So then I got, you know, SHIT for that. Yeah. As, um, I don't know if I'm, am I allowed to curse? I'm not you sure. are absolutely allowed to say whatever the fuck you want. Oh, okay. Thank you. So I got tons of shit for that because I wanted to uh, be a human rights lawyer and, um, my parents were like, well, that doesn't make enough money. Thought, Why don't you do corporate law? And so oh, God. I know I just kind of gave up. I was like, they're never going to be happy with whatever choice I make. So might as well just do whatever. Right. And, and they were cool with it. They're, they're like, oh yeah, you're a really good writer. You're as long as you're, you know, make money doing whatever you do, knock yourself out. Well, they got, it's Sorry, like, did I get too much credit right now? I mean, I, I, you're giving my South Asian parents too much. I credit. think I stepped the gas on that one. Let me take the pe pe you know, foot off the pedal over here. Yeah, they were like, okay, well, we'll accept this. They weren't. That wasn't. I mean, I did have a cousin try to like out me, and my uh, some actually somebody else in my family, two cousins, tried to like out me as like a sex writer, and my dad got kind of upset and was trying to lecture me about it, and I was like, you know, I'm a grown adult, right? Like I can. I right. And I also was like, stop trying to shame me because I felt embarrassed. So then I was like, I didn't do anything wrong. Like when you look around, like people talk about sex all the time and they get rewarded for it. It's not a big deal. Um, right. If so, it wasn't for sex, we won't be here, Rachel. Especially Indians. I mean, God. It's, most billion people? it's a billion of us, Rachel. <laughs> it's a billion of us. Somebody's yeah. fucking for sure. Somebody's definitely having sex for sure. Yeah. So it's ridiculous. Um, yeah, so I did get a little shame for that, but now it's kind of like a don't ask, don't tell 
mm-hmm. sort of thing. Um, but, you know, they, they are proud of me now, especially that now that I have my own company and they've seen some of the stuff that I sell. And they actually, they're kind of proud of me now because they've seen how other people react, which I think is a very Asian thing. Right. South Asian, where um, they might have not thought it was a great idea, but then when they've seen how other people react towards the stuff I sell, how much they love it, and they're laughing. Yeah. Kind of like, oh, oh, okay. She's, she's like legit, you know? Right, right, right. Um, so I, I was, um, now you have this uh, awesome studio you uh, started. It's called uh, Crimson and Clover Studio. What is that? So yeah, that's the company I started. It's a stationery and gift company. So it sell, we sell, uh, let's see, greeting cards, candles, mugs, pencils, anything kind of gifty, necklaces. Um, okay. Apparel. Yeah. And so the tone of it is very... Um, let's say funny slash R rated slash X rated. Yeah. Um, first card that I made was thanks for having a big dick. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, wait, that's a card. That's a card. And people buy it to send it to people that they ha- have big dicks. I'm assuming there's significant others. Although I've had people like buy multiple of the same card. And so I'm like, are they, sending it to multiple guys or are they just buying one for each of their friends to send to their guys? I don't know, but I'm like, (laughs) big dick card to to them. Good Good for for them. Good, good, good for you for creating that card. I'm sure someone out there is appreciating it and uh, buying it. Um, uh, I want to talk to you about some of the, uh, I mean, you write for a lot of really big publications. You write for, you've written for Playboy, Penthouse, Washington Post, Maxim, Allure, Marie Claire, Cosmopolitan, uh, Shape, The New York Times. I mean, a lot, a lot of really, uh, you know, uh, big publications. Mm-hmm. What, uh, I mean, what are, like, are, are they usually, I mean, I was reading some of the blogs and some of your stories, and they're really fantastic and hilarious. And it's funny because this week we had a sex therapist on, and we were talking about uh, fragile male egos, and we were talking about small dick sizes, right? Uh, and uh, and we were talking about how, for, for guys, that's a really big topic. Like, yeah. penis size is a very sensitive topic. Guys don't want to talk about it. They're just like, if you got it, you got it. I don't want to like, you know, that if you have a small penis, like I don't want to talk about it. Uh, and I was like, you know, so I was reading your piece about the, um, you did a piece about the, the, the small dick uh, and you met this guy named Sean uh, and this guy, Sean was going to be in Philly and you were going to be in Philly because you were visiting your parents and you're 20 minutes from Philly. Uh, and then all hell broke loose because you guys hooked up in New York was right. Yeah. You guys hooked up in New York. So tell that story, Rachel. Would you mind telling that story? Because I thought it was fucking hysterical. Well, so basically I met this guy playing beer pong at a bar. This is when I lived in New York. And um, we just, like, it was one of those, we I fucked and we kind of looked at each other and it was like, oh my God, like it's on. And so we started flirting all night. He walks me to the subway and like kisses me and like, you know, chemistry feels really good. Mm. Um, you know, we, we went out on a few dates and then we finally, you know, it was like, I don't know, the third date and it was like, let's, let's sleep together. So, um, <laughs> let's so, do it. what? Let's do it. Yeah, let's do it. I'm like, it's time. It's the third date. So, um, yeah, we, we did it. And I was just like, oh, like it was really small. And I actually never experienced anything that small before. Yeah. So, like, all these things were going through my mind. One is that, like, like it reminded me of Samantha and Sex and the City because it was, like, I really liked him. Yeah. You know? And so I didn't want to, like, break up with the guy because of his penis size. But he also didn't seem to make up for it in any other way, shape, or form, like, at all. And so I was very confused. I'm, like, you're not really good at – you're just not good at sex, period, outside of your dick size. So I was just like, I don't even know how to approach this or how to say something. And so at one point, I actually was like Googling and like looking on Amazon for like (laughs) penis prosthetics. (laughs) Like maybe he can just like wear one and then that would be fine. Are you kidding me? That is like the biggest blow to a man's ego. I know. 
But and like the thing is, is like, yeah, it's like, how do you even bring that up? Like, right. I wear this. Like, I, I don't know. But it would have been so much better if he just knew and was like, you know what? I know I have a small dick, but I'm gonna be really good at oral. Or I'm just gonna be really wild in bed, or I'm gonna, I don't know, like pick you up and throw you around. I mean, it was just straight up vanilla sex, and then it had a small penis. So it was just oh. like. And so I'm trying to figure out how to make this work. And like, I still found him really attractive. We got along really well. Yeah. Um, but then he ends up breaking up with me after all, like, and because it was something because like, I don't know, I think I'm trying to remember. He broke up with me, I think, because he wasn't like over the like trauma of his like his bipolar ex. It was like something like that. Okay. I was just like, oh my God, I've been sitting here trying to work with your penis and you've broken up with me I was just like, oh my god like this is so not fair he deserves it yeah. oh my god i was like so annoyed by it that like i didn't beat him to the punch um poor guy yeah i'm so bad for guys like that i really do it's just like look that for a guy that's just a random luck of a draw right yeah. nobody gets to pick their penis size nobody like that's just not a thing right um it's just not a thing it's just something you're born with what are you gonna do uh you gotta just roll with the punches uh and, and i feel bad listen i once uh went out with a guy indian guy actually really liked him we had an awesome chemistry he was fantastic lovely human being just an absolutely lovely human being uh and when it came time to do the deed um it wasn't it wasn't even like two inches, if that. It was like a hole, like, uh, and I, I, I was like, a I hole? Up, yeah, it was just like a hole. I, <laughs> I remember looking at him and being like, "Oh my god!" I felt so bad for him. I made him breakfast. I was just like, "I'm just gonna make you breakfast because life has been cruel to you." Yeah, so like, you just have a hole. Like that's okay. all you got. Like, how can you even have sex with that? You can't. You can't. It's just for pain. That's it. That's all it's for. Like that's oh, it. That, that's it. That, he had a hole. Like that's it. He had a hole. You know, I was just like, uh, good luck. I'll make you breakfast and then you can be on your merry way, sir. Um, <laughs> move yeah. along. Nothing. I mean, what are you going to get out of that? I mean, gosh, I feel bad for guys like that. I I feel so bad because you know what? They're nice guys, right? Yeah. And life just dealt them a rough hand and they just got to deal with it, right? And I, I feel bad for guys like that because I, I feel like there are genuinely good guys out there who sometimes are not very a suave or they're not good in bed or they have small penises and it's like, and they really miss out on girl. People don't want to give them a chance because you know, they got that thing going on. Right. Well, and that's the thing that's so ridiculous about this other guy is like, I was giving him a chance. It's right. like, I think he was coasting on the fact that he was good looking. So, you know, he'll meet somebody else, but still, I mean, at the end of the day, People you still want to come through. You still have to come through. I don't give a shit how good your looks are. That's your like. looks are not going to make me come, honey. Like, that's not going to happen. Exactly. They're not at no. all. So Your looks are not giving me orgasms, so take a deep breath. Exactly. Um, you, I, I was listening to this interview you did a long time ago, actually, with this guy named uh, Scott McKay or something like that. Oh, uh, long time ago. And you guys had a really interesting conversation that I really appreciated. Which was, you know, look, you, I'm sure you get asked that and have been asked that. I get asked that. So, like, we're, so, uh, we're like, where are you from? And I'm like, oh, I'm from New York. No, where are you really from? And yeah. it's always a way of, like, making someone feel isolated as if they don't belong. As if what you are, you don't belong. Just because, yeah. you know, you, you speak with an American accent, you grew up in America. Like, you're not, what you are is not enough to be American. You know what I'm saying? Because exactly. your skin color doesn't match someone who, you know, because you're not white or whatever, right? You're not like, and I just, I, I'm always like blown away by that conversation. So uh, you guys were having this conversation how some guys, for me, so I'm born and partially raised in Pakistan and I moved when I was 15. And uh, the one of the things that guys always say to me, oh my God, are you, uh, oh, you're Pakistani? I'm like, yes. They're like, I love Indian food what (laughs) 
what? How did you come up with that right now? Like they try to relate to you and maybe they don't come from a bad place, but it's yeah. so weird to have that conversation. Yeah. What are some of the things you've experienced? Oh my God. Yeah, that is weird. Um, Gosh, there's been so many. Um, Well, one is you don't look American. Right. Um, Right, you don't look American. Yeah. The where are you really from question. Yeah. The, I've had people say, you don't know. You don't, you speak really good American. That's what the guy said. So you speak American or not even English? He didn't even say English. He said, you speak good American. I was like, oh, wow. <laughs> okay. I'm like, what is going on here? America's not even a language. I know. It was so ridiculous. And like, I mean, I had so many thoughts about that. But then what else? I had a guy, I'm trying to think. Oh, I had a guy once tell me I didn't look all Ganesh. What does that mean? Wait, what? He was like, you're not, all, he's like, you're not all Ganesh and stuff. And I'm like, I'm not like an elephant god? Like, what does that mean? I was like, I have no idea. I think he was trying to say, like, you're not typically Indian. I think that's what he's trying to say. Yeah. But that's still not, that's not a compliment. It's like, you know, I've heard black people saying that white people say to them, oh, you're not like the other black people. Like, I kind of felt like that's what he was getting at. And it's like, that isn't a compliment. <laughs> you're not Yeah. Um, what oh, I the other thing that's interesting is everyone thinks I'm Latin. So I get like kind of sometimes like double stereotypes. Like one guy was like, oh, you're, <laughs> uh, you know, you've got that like urban Latina vibe. I'm like, I'm Indian. Wow. The opposite side of the world. Right. And I grew up in the burbs, in like nice burbs. Like I'm not, I didn't grow up on like the hard streets that you're kind of suggesting. Yeah. You know, also like, can Latin people not grow up in the suburbs? Can they only grow up in the cities? Like, do you yeah. Like, can, the whole thing was like ridiculous, and I was like calling him out one by one, and you could just see the head like just like, well, like he just knew that he stuck his foot in his mouth, and like yeah, well, like a bunch of stereotypes, and it's not, it's not even the same race as me. To so just add that extra layer, it's like so ridiculous. Wow, wow! Uh, uh, somebody, uh, uh, triple do scratcher said you both speak great American. Thank you for that. Thank Appreciate you. it, triple do scratcher. Uh, we do speak great American. I'm very proud to speak great American. I I mean, it, it's like that when you go to London, too. Uh, I don't know if you've... Uh, really? You, yeah, it's, it's a little bit like that, too. Uh, the, the, the weirdest thing for me was when I went to London was I was sitting at a bar with another... Uh, girlfriend, a Desi girlfriend, and um, we, uh, and this uh, this British guy turned and he goes, he's like, is that an American accent I hear? And I was like, yes. And he's like, oh, your accent's so exotic. I'm like, no one in the world has ever fucking said that to me. Like, ever. Nobody oh, thinks my never. accent is exotic. Like, wh- I sound like so New York. Like, nobody's ever been like, ooh, exotic New York accent. It's fucking weird to say that. Uh, but I, uh, yeah, I remember going to Portugal uh, Munich is a weird place. Uh, it's very strange. They look at you and they're like, did you lose your way? You need to go back to the, uh, get it back on that plane and fucking leave. You don't need to be here right now. We oh don't really need you. Yeah. Munich is very strange. If you've ever been to Munich. I have, uh, I backpacked Europe after, um, college and yeah, yeah I, but I mean, so I was in a lot of these cities for like a day or two. Got so, it. But I lived in Ireland after college for a few months. Oh, the um, Irish guys love us. They love us. Girl, they love us. I had no idea. Yeah. And the, I I like, oh God, like, I am the belle of the ball. Um, yeah, you are. They love the accent. They didn't say exotic. I think one guy said it was like, like 90210, like Valley Girl. Like, I got a lot of like that kind of um, thing. Like, they were picturing like what they saw on TV. Uh-huh. Kind of like transposing it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I do have a little bit of Valley Girl, but like, yeah. I just thought it was, like really funny that that was like so um, exciting to them. But you know, people here get excited about British accents, so I guess it's like you know, Americans get excited about any other accent besides their own. Uh, Americans have just like very low self esteem when it comes to our own accents. We really do. Uh, really, really, yeah, we do. Start appreciating a little bit more uh, of our own accent. I um, 
I uh, was reading this one piece about you were talking about that you went out with a guy in the mafia. How the fuck do you end up going out with a guy in the mafia? Well, I'm from New Jersey. Right. So There's a lot of mafiosos there. Yes. Yeah. Not to like indulge in more stereotypes, but there are. Okay. And um, well, it's funny because I didn't actually know um, because I was like 17 and I was um, working at this movie theater. Yeah. And the other girls that I was with or I was working with, they, we, we kind of became friends or whatever. And like, we all went out and they had like some guy friends there and they were like, Oh, Jimmy likes you or whatever. And I was like, Oh my God, he's so cute. And like, blah, blah, blah. And like, we gone out on a date and he had like a really nice car. And I was like, well, first of all, this is also disturbing. But, and at the time it like didn't register in my head, but I was 17 and he was 27, which in retrospect is disgusting. It's gross. It's so gross. And at the time, I, but the thing is I've been repressed as an Indian kid and like, you know, shocking, Rachel, an Indian I know, right? I Never know. heard of that before. <laughs> I, right. And so like, my parents are just like, don't date, You're, you know, just don't do any of it. And so it wasn't like my parents had sat me down to like educate me on like certain things. Like if I had a kid, I'd be like, hey, that's weird, you know, right. and these are all the reasons why. Right. Um, but I just didn't put two and two together at that point. So but he he drove a really nice car. It was like, it was a Mercedes, but like a Mercedes convertible. And it was really kind of like fancy. Yeah. Mercedes convertible is. And so I remember thinking like, he seemed kind of young to have this car. And then mm-hmm. I was trying to ask him what he did for a living. And he's being very evasive. And, you know, I work for my uncle. And I was like, well, that's kind of, I mean, but like doing what? You know what I mean? Did he have the gold chain? What are you like talking like a Guido? He's like, yeah. This no, he seems about, like nothing. No, no dead giveaways. Like totally like normal. Uh, yeah, I didn't. He's actually very attractive. Like I didn't see anything remotely red flagish as far as that was concerned. So I'm kind of just going like, all right, this is a little odd, but he's cute. You know, when you're 17, I mean, do you really think of much else besides like he's cute? Like, yeah. I mean, I didn't. Um, so and you're then, seven and you're 17. Yeah. And like this really cute guy was paying attention to me and I was, I was just like, all right, whatever. Mm-hmm. And so I asked... The, my coworkers at work, then my next shift, I was like, so what does he do for a living? And they're like, oh, you didn't know he's in the mafia? And I was like, no, I didn't know that. Whoa. And you should have told me that. Hello. Wow. <laughs> wow. This is not, I don't know, the godfather. or And, and then she got whacked after, right? Right after she informed you that she, she went missing? <laughs> she did not go missing. They found her body in a dumpster somewhere now? That's what I was worried about for myself. I was like, I have to extricate myself from this before I end up in the river, whatever the phrase is, with sl- sleeping with the fish. Sleeping so, with the fishes, yeah. Sleeping with yeah. the fishes. Yeah, the Sopranos, baby. Yeah, exactly. I was like, that's not going to happen for me. So it sounds really bad, but again, preface this by saying I was 17. Yes. I lied and I told him that I had leukemia because I figured that, like, if he thought I was dying, he wouldn't want to date me. <laughs> I'm like I wasn't interested anymore because I was scared like oh my god then he's gonna like right he's gonna feel rejected yeah exactly exactly yeah. so I said that to him and I kind of tried to lay it on thick I was like oh you know I really might need you by my side and like I never heard from him again oh man you know what Rachel that gives me a really good idea of the next time I went out go out with a guy I don't like I'm gonna be like I have anal cancer um god yeah say that I have a uh, colorectal, uh, what's a, not that I want to joke about something like that because Chadwick Boseman just recently passed away from it, oh, but yeah. holy fucking hell, like talk about like laying on thick uh, and holy shit. Some guys are like clingers, you know, some guys are fucking clingers stage five too. Some girls are fucking clinger stage five. So it's not even a gender, one specific gender thing. Uh, there is a, there's a guy here and he has, he has issues with feminism. Uh, he said, please talk about this. Good guys are taken for granted by so-called feminists today who only everything revolves around them, totally misinterpreting the true meaning of feminism or equality. Men deserve equal care and love. Well, first of all, Muhammad, I would like to say, yes, men do deserve equal care and love. Uh, but I believe uh, you are confusing uh, feminism 
uh, with people who are just have their own personal issues. You know, it's just like, it's the same with masculinity, uh, right? It's the same argument you can make with masculinity. I mean, I'm sure you've been on dates, Rachel, where guys are just totally inconsiderate. Like the guy sending you a fucking invoice of a hundred some odd dollars and he's not picking up emotional cues. You know, the same goes with girls. So what are your thoughts about uh, some good guys are being taken for granted, Rachel, according to Muhammad? Well, I don't even know what the fuck he's talking about. You know, <laughs> <laughs> like massive generalization. Like, okay, we live in a world of how many bazillion people? Like some good guys are taken for granted. Right? Well, some good girls are taken for granted. I mean, I don't know. Unless you have a specific thing. Like, I, I mean, that's just so vague. But yeah, I mean... It's not like women don't have their complaints about guys, but yeah, men, mansplaining. Let's like that, for example, like how many times have I had, you know, men try, like the invoice guy, he was trying to mansplain, he was trying to mansplain my nail polish to me. Like, what? (laughs) I mean, I've gotten manicures and pedicures on the regular for years. That's primarily something women do. I, why are you explaining this to me? I mean, I've had men. What were you explaining? That the fact that why did you pick your colors and it has something to psychologically? Yeah, psychological to do with what I, you know, what's going on in my brain that day, which makes no sense. Um, I've had, I had a man mansplain, a white man mansplain yoga to me. Oh, wow. Like, yeah. I was like, that's, he didn't know I was Indian, of course, oh. but still. I mean, I had, I used to, my old job, I used to read contracts all the time. Um, and I had an ex-boyfriend try to mansplain to me how to read contracts. I was like, you realize I get paid to do this, like literally every single day, but you're mansplaining how I should be doing it. I even had my father, my own father, mansplain to me how to run a business. I was like, uh, does anyone else in your family run a business that wasn't given to them by their parents? Right. Uh, no, they don't. So it's like... What Wait, did you, tell, did you use the word mansplaining with your dad? Did you use that? We were like, dad, you're mansplaining me. And dad is like, what is the mansplaining? Yeah, I didn't even use the word with him because it's not like he even know what I'm talking exactly. about. I just was like, I just kind of was like yelling back. I was just like, I was like, Gautam doesn't know shit about running a business. Like, so stop telling me. He was literally telling me to go call my cousin in India for advice. And I was like, advice for what? Like, it just made no sense. Like, but yeah, I've had men tell me how to run my business, how to be funnier, how to write, how to read contracts, how to do yoga. How to be um, funnier. Wow. That's, I've never, as a comic, I've never heard that one before, Rachel. Which one? Uh, oh my God. You could be like totally way funnier if you do this. And I'm like, oh my God. You know what? Never, a man's never told you that. Oh yeah. I've had guys tell me, oh my God, you know, it be, yeah. Oh my God. It would be so funny. I'm like, you know, it would be so funny. If you go to the top of a building and jump off, it would be, <laughs> would be hilarious. Funny. I would laugh my ass. It would be hilarious. Um, I just, yeah, yeah there's, a, there's, there's a lot of that. There's a lot of like, uh, as comics, you know, as a stand-up comic, like you get a lot of uh, guys who are like, uh, hey, if you want to work on some jokes, I'm like, you're running fucking open mics and I'm booking shows. You think I need to sit down with you to punch up my jokes? Right. But- exactly. Exactly. What? I mean, I think that's what happened. I feel that I, I think what is happening right now, uh, like guys like Muhammad uh, and other people are somehow confusing feminism with always the extreme ideology. Right. So there's extreme ideologies on both sides, whether it's male or female. Right. So whenever there are women who are like, kill all the men, they're awful and we don't need them. People are like, oh, my God, that's feminism. All the feminists feel that way. And it's just like, no, we fucking don't. I don't want as awful as men have been to me in my throughout my entire fucking life. I still don't want men annihilated from this planet. Of course okay. not. Let me make something very clear here. But I think there is this gr- grave misunderstanding about feminism that somehow feminists are these women walking around de- like devising a plan of how we're going to murder and annihilate all the men on the planet. And the truth is that is the farthest thing from the truth. All we're asking for is equality financially. Uh, I mean, on, you know, work wise, no harassment. We're just asking for basic shit. We're not asking yeah. you to give us more than what you have. That's the thing I don't understand. And it's very basic stuff. Like things like I would love to be able to walk around at night without being worried about being raped and murdered. I know we have a long ways to go. That happens. 
exactly. Like, you know, a sexual harassment. I would like that not to happen. You know, like I, again, equal pay for equal work. Like the list goes on and on. I would like you to respect my opinion. Like, I'm not going to try to like explain something to you if that's your expertise. I would not go up to you as a comic and be like, you know what? It'd be funny. Like, I want to be respected <laughs> as a human being with right. opinions, not because I'm a woman, but just because, like, this as a person, you know, like my ex would, like I said, mansplain the humor to me. And I'm like, well, I'm a humorous writer and my company is all based on humor. So that's how I make my living. That is not how you make your living. So what I do you do? What talking about. What did he, he do? Re- he owned restaurants and he was successful at it, but that's like a completely different skill set. Hey, man, why don't you go do some dishes, okay? Give your dishwasher a break once you go do some dishes. Right. And, like, I'm not sitting here telling you how to run a restaurant, you know? So that's one thing. Basic, like, just equal things. Like, I don't think most women would think to explain these things to other people. And I don't think if I was a man, he would try to explain it to me. I think he was trying to explain it to me because I was like, I'm a girl. Okay. Right, 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 right. I feel like, you know, uh, our generation, Rachel, is, is really the one who is kind of bearing the brunt of like kind of taking this stuff to the next level where we are like we are the generation of women that is like saying to guys, hey, guys, it's not cool to mansplain. It's not cool to use these microaggressions, these sexism comments and think that it's okay. It's not okay to do that, right? The the women that came before us, they were just like, hey, can we at least just fucking vote? Can we just get the right to vote, okay? And I feel like every generation, uh, whether it's men or women, but especially for women, we are just working out all these kinks in society when it yeah. comes to the gender inequality. Yeah, exactly. Like, I'm not trying to cut anyone's balls off. Like, I, I like balls. Yeah, I like balls. I mean, I want you to be, I'm not trying to emasculate anybody. I'm like, do your thing, you know? That's totally fine with me. Um, but just don't treat me like I'm a dummy or don't sexually harass me. And I think that's pretty basic. Why yeah. is that difficult to understand? <laughs> I mean, Rachel, now you've been to India, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now, when you go to India, do you get sexually harassed on the streets? Cat calling? Yeah, totally. Not, not like an ass or a titty grab at some time? Well, this is the thing. We've, uh, I've never been on public transport and we've been very like sheltered in the sense of like getting into a car. And yeah. To be. Um, yeah. And not doing a ton of like walking about. Okay. I have when I was younger, but definitely when I was a little bit older, it was like, you know, apartment, car, restaurant kind of thing. Got it. Got it. Um, But the other thing that's interesting is, like, Indians don't think we're Indian either. So, um... Not Indian enough. No, not Indian at all. Oh, not Indian at all. Because? Because they think... I've actually been called, like, a gory when I've been there. Because they don't think I'm Indian. And my mom, actually, when she was growing up, they thought she was an Anglo-Indian. They thought she was, you know, mixed English and Indian. So it's, like, also weird because they don't... I don't know. They don't think I'm Indian. So I think there's a little bit of like, I don't know. I feel like I'm, I get treated a little bit differently, but it's not better. Oh, it, oh like I'll, off kind of thing. I, we always, I always get the, whenever I visit Pakistan, which is almost every 10, 15 years, um, whenever I go, it's always, it's always like, oh my God, you still haven't forgotten your mother tongue. <laughs> That's amazing. I'm like, what? It's my mother tongue language I learned. How could I forget it? You can't forget your, I don't think you can forget your mother tongue. You can't. It's too so ingrained in your subconscious. There's no freaking way you can forget it. Oh yeah. my God. My, uh, my aunt, uh, because you know about colorism, it's a very big deal in South Asia. People bleaching their skin and wanting to be lighter skin and wanting to be white and all that crap. Um, I remember uh, visiting my aunt and my aunt is a lot darker skin than I am. And I've always been very tan, very dark. I get very dark in summer and stuff. I, I tan a lot. And uh, I remember my aunt looking at me and being like, oh my God, you're still so dark. I thought America would make you white. Oh my God. <laughs> I was like, what? What, is that? what does that mean? What the fuck does that mean, Rachel? What I does that mean? I don't know. Indians are obsessed with color and it's so just... It's just weird. I mean, I I think it's a vestige from when the British were there and, you know, 
colorism and like, you know, kind of similar to how it was here with slaves and stuff like that. So I feel like that's maybe part of it. Yes. Now, obviously, if you are a laborer, you're, you work in the sun and you're going to be darker. So that's probably. Hence the farmer's tan that they call it, the farmer's tan. And if you're rich, you'd be inside and you right. less have less color yes yeah so i'm kind of i think maybe that's like over years it's come from like a socioeconomic thing but yeah. it go away it's stupid I, and I feel like uh i i feel like there is so much work uh to be done not just among the south asian communities in america or in the west but i mean even you know in india in pakistan and uh, you know and pretty much all of south asia of how people perceive color, of how they perceive color on women. Like a woman cannot be dark. It is literally a, a thing against her. It's like, you can be like this stunning, gorgeous woman with dark skin and people will demean you and look down on you because you have dark skin. You can come from a wealthy family, be incredibly educated, be brilliant at what you do and still be judged just based on the fact that you have dark skin. And it's a really like this colonialist, this, you know, the what the British left us with. And it's that same perpetuating that really fucked up bullshit mentality and over and over again. And I feel like now the bigger conversations are happening where it's like, hey, colorism isn't cool. We don't need fucking fair and lovely. We don't need to bleach our skin to be pretty. You are beautiful just the way you are. Accept yourself and break yourself. It's fine. You know, my mom used to bleach the hell out of my skin growing up. And I used to hate that shit. Gosh. I used to hate. And she's like, you're so dark. No man is going to marry you. Oh, skin And like, like fucking cussing at me and like bleaching my skin. It's 120 degrees outside. and pockets. I mean, it's just horrible it's freaking traumatizing as a kid and you're just like oh my god what i am is less than you're making you're telling me that i am less than you're telling me that i will not amount to anything because i'm born a certain way right and that's so fucked you know did you ever experience anything like that rachel no just because we're pretty light skin um yeah. so well, for- well, fuck you then, Rachel. Yeah, no, my, all my Indian friends are like, all right, well, go fuck yourself. <laughs> like, all right, you didn't experience it. All right, we get it. Yeah. You're, we and get it, Rachel. I actually, I did the DNA test and it said I'm 100% Indian. So, I mean, I don't know. It is it is what it is. Where in India is your family from? Uh, my mom is from Karnataka and my dad is from, he's Kachi. So he's from. You, so they're both from the South. No, Kutch is part of Gujarat. So oh, Kutch is part of Gujarat, sorry. So we're mid. Got it, got it, got it. You're yeah. mid. But got they, it. they grew up in Bombay. Or Mumbai. Got it, got it. Now, when you, uh, do you ever get slack from like relatives or anything or cousins? Like you said, the cousins were trying to get you in trouble uh, for being a sex writer. Is that something like, how's your family with it now? Are they like, yeah, just do your thing. You're really good at what you do. Knock yourself out. No, I mean, they're still just like, you know, we don't really talk about uh, any of it, really. I mean, I did tell them when I wrote for the New York Times, and they were like, you know, proud of that. Um, sure. But generally, we don't talk about any sort of career stuff. Like, I, and they don't really ask me. I mean, occasionally they'll be like, "Oh, how's business doing?" But for them, I think you know, unless it's like I'm buying a house, I'm buying a car or spending money on something that's like a visible uh, manifestation of being very successful and having a lot of money. They really don't care. It's just, okay. so, or South Asian, you know, uh, they see that to, to really just not uh, um, care. So it's, and it kind of used to drive me nuts for a while. Cause I also used to feel like I'm, I'm not good enough. I'm never good enough because I'm not like, I don't yeah. have traditional. That's purpose. the default of all South Asian kids, Rachel. Yeah. Never good enough. Right. It's completely the default yes. for sure. Yes. And so I think that's kind of been more of my issue. I'm like, well, why don't they like ask me about, you know, my career or what's going on or blah, blah, blah. And I just kind of had to accept that that's their limitation. And it's just like never going to happen. And so, you know, it is, right. it is. I, um, we have a comment here from uh, James, who is a big fan, and I adore and love James. He's here every day. Uh, he says, I think guys in a relationship sometimes fall into two modes, fix-it mode and listen mode. Sometimes guys pick the wrong mode when dealing with their significant other. What say you, Rachel? 
You know, I think that I think he's probably onto something with that. I think a lot of times guys do want to just like fix the problem. And, you know, women are just like, I just want you to hear me. I mean, I will say sometimes I actually do it to my girlfriends where I'm trying to fix it. Yeah. They just want me to listen. Um, so, yeah, I think he's like, I think he's right. Sometimes you just are like, just shut up and listen to me. So do you, but do you think, it, do you think women can make guys life easier by telling them, be like, hey, listen, I'm going to share something with you. I don't need you to fix it. I just want you to listen to it. Is that something you think women can do better at communicating? Yeah, totally. I think it's good to put that, like, communicate your needs all the time and put that, that, like, disclaimer out there or this is what I need right now and right. don't try to fix it because your significant other is not your girlfriend. So it's going to be, you know, they don't necessarily know. And so, yeah, I think it's important to, to say that. And I think sometimes men can be uncomfortable with the emotion. And so. No, no, just, wait, Rachel, get out I, of here. It, no. Just flash. Yeah. So they're just like, okay, let me just like fix this problem. Like, I just don't, I want you to feel better. So I think it comes from a good place. Like, I just don't want you to see upset. I want this to be fixed and move on. And so I think, yeah, communicating your needs is always. It's so funny. Uh, I called up my brother and um, I had been working on this project and it kind of fell through and it was really heartbreaking. And I was like really in the dumps emotionally about it. And my brother's like, what's going on? I'm like, man, I'm just, I feel like crap. Like, and I'm really depressed about this. And he was like, oh, it's depressed. What do you have to be depressed about? I was like, man, I was working on this thing and just fell through and just really kind of pumped out about it. And then he was like, just take a walk. He goes, just take a walk. You'll be fine. <laughs> That's walk. Awesome. Yeah. Just, just walk, just walk it off. And I was just like, I'm going to go before I cuss you out. So I'm going to go now. <laughs> I was like, I'm going to go before I hang up on you and cuss you out. But I, I think, uh, I, I think he meant well. Yeah, he doesn't want me to be depressed. He doesn't want his sister to be depressed. He's trying to fix it. It's like, well, I don't want you to fix it. I just want you to hear me out. I'm venting to you about something. I have friends who call me and they just vent about shit and I don't offer them any advice unless they ask me for it. I'm just like, shut up. Yeah. I, or I, I try to take the therapist approach sometimes where I'm like, well, how does that make you feel? <laughs> <laughs> Everyone on you, do you just hear a phone clicking on the other side? Like, <laughs> no, I find that like people a lot of times like they like to hear that question. Yeah. They just like, I don't know, sometimes I think people like a little bit of the, the therapy because it's like you're kind of just encouraging them to talk more about themselves, which people like to do anyway. Sure. And so and sometimes they like figure it out just by talking it out enough. And they're like, yeah. oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I, uh, can we, uh, can we please, uh, talk about, uh, fetishizing for a second? I think it's, uh, it's always, uh, fascinating. Uh, I, I want to talk about first about, uh, we were talking about colorism and all that. I want to talk about uh, Priyanka Chopra for a second. Uh, Priyanka Chopra, when she came out, uh, said that she had a, um, she had a song called Exotic. Uh, and she was like, I'm feeling so exotic. And it was like, oh, okay. Priyanka's feeling exotic. Um, and then she later came out and said, oh, my God, I don't like to be called exotic. And it was like, uh, bitch, you came out with a whole song that's called exotic. Uh, so make up your damn mind. That. Make up your goddamn mind. Yeah. And then, of course, uh, a lot of Americans don't know, but Priyanka Chopra got paid millions of dollars by Fair and Lovely for skin bleaching, right? For Fair, she's a, She was a big Fair and Lovely spokesperson. She got paid millions of dollars for it. Uh, and then uh, she was... Recently, Bollywood, a lot of Bollywood actors got in hot trouble because they were tweeting about BLM and, you know, Black Lives Matter. And it was just like, you guys are the biggest fucking hypocrites. Like, oh, totally. you, you guys are promoting, like, fair and lovely skin. You're saying, you know, dark skin isn't good. You got to be lighter skin. And then you're talking about BLM. Like, you guys are a bunch of fucking hypocrites. Uh, and the same applies to Priyanka Chopra because she's a hypocrite also uh, about saying that, you know, you know, Black Lives Matter, this and that. It's like, well, bitch, you were promoting fair and lovely and you got millions of dollars for it. Are you going to donate some of those millions of dollars towards Black Lives Matter? No? Okay, then sh shut the fuck up. Um, so I, I don't really have a lot of respect for people when they start talking like that because yeah. they don't put their money where their mouth is, right? You're you're only perpetuating the issue. You're, you're part of the problem, not part of the solution. So right. 
I, uh, you know, I, I listen to stuff like that. So I, that brings me to the point about like fetishizing and stuff like that because she's putting out a song called Exotic. Um, God knows, I'm sure. How many times have you been called exotic, Rachel? I've lost track. I have no idea. <laughs> so many. Exotic, like an animal. Like, wow. Yeah, I'm just like, I don't know. I'm from Jersey. Like, is that, that exotic? Yeah. I don't it's just I'm sorry Rachel there is nothing exotic about Jersey <laughs> I'm so sorry Rachel I'm somebody who went to high school in Jersey City there is nothing exotic about New Jersey no I love New Jersey but no I would not call it exotic at all and what does exotic really mean exotic is just something that's foreign to you anyway because you know what people in Brazil don't walk around going like I'm exotic. Like people in Asia don't walk around going, I'm exotic. Like that's, that's you don't know that, Rachel. You don't know that. Maybe they are. They're walking around saying, I'm exotic. I'm so exotic. <laughs> like super weird if they were. But like people are just living their lives. You know, it's just like, it's just, you know, well, you know, I have to say in India though, they're very fascinated by white skin. So it's just, I think people get fascinated by something that they haven't seen before, or don't see very often. Yeah. But I do think, I mean, calling someone exotic that you're trying to hit on, because that's usually where it comes from. It's yeah. stupid. It's so idiotic. Like, why can't we relate to people as people and not make the first thing we want to talk about the way their their ethnic appearance, how they appear? Right. Which you talked about in your interview with Scott McKay. You talked about how, you know, you've had guys who are just like, oh, my God, you're like, you're like so exotic or like, where are you from? Or, or, hey, I've been to India and let me tell you all about the Indian history. Let me yeah. tell you everything. And you're like, uh, I don't care. Yeah, I don't care. And like, why are you explaining it back to me anyway? <laughs> like, where it's like, oh, where's your ancestry from? Oh, it's from uh, from England. Let me tell you everything I know about England. Yeah. Uh, well, bad, bad food, uh, bad teeth. Uh, and your royals are a bunch of ripoffs. Uh, like, the, let yeah, and you raped and pillaged the whole world. Yeah, and you pillaged exactly. Let let let's not even mention the Israel Palestine mess that today it's in. No thanks to the British, the India Pakistan mess that's British. I mean, they've just basically went around the world and caused fires, and then being like, now we shall leave with your resources. Toodaloo. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, we <laughs> stole all of your resources. We forced yeah. you into famine. Yeah. So, yeah. Thanks, guys. Exactly. Um, I um, tell me a story about that. Is I'm sure you have one of the stories about being fetishized, and you're just like, yo, what the fuck? Yeah, actually, okay. There was this guy that I met at like a bar like a, a while ago, and uh, he's in New York or Bay Area. Uh, Bay Area, actually. Okay. Um, and. We saw each other across the bar, and I was like, oh, okay, he's, like, really cute. I was telling my friend, like, that guy's really cute. And so we kind of locked eyes, and then, like, his friend came over, and I was like, oh, my friend thinks you're cute. And I was like, okay. So we started talking, and he, first thing out of his mouth is like, I just love Latina women. And I'm like, oh, God, here we go. I'm <laughs> just like, and I was like, well, I was like, I hate to disappoint you, but I'm out. And he's like, oh, but. And then he goes, oh, but he's like, you were wearing hoop earrings. So I thought, I know. I was like, women of every race wear hoop earrings all the time. I'm like, literally, there's a white blonde girl over there wearing hoop earrings. So that makes no sense. Um, and so then he just realized, like, he had just stuck the foot further in the mouth. Yeah. Um, yes. Kind of stuttering. He was like, bleh, bleh, bleh. But wait, did he at least get to know you? Be like, hey, tell me about yourself. What's your name? You're really beautiful. Like, I mean, we talked a little bit. I mean, I, he had just bought me a drink. And so yeah. he, and so I was just kind of sitting there going like. Um, As he's roofing the drink, he's like, so tell me more about yourself. Oh my, no, he wasn't, he wasn't like sinister. He was just stupid, you know? Like, so, um, and then we kept talking, and also I was like, he's really cute, so, like, let's see if if this gets better. Yeah. And it did not. It just got worse. So then, you know, I'm like, my family's from India, and he goes, <laughs> he goes, oh, my friend went to Bhutan, and I was like. Oh, Jesus. I know. I was like, I was just looking at him like, all right, that's cool. Wow. wow. 
Wow. I just thought that's cool. And I think you wanted me to say something more. And then I'm like, you know, Bhutan is not part of India, right? Like that's. <laughs> Did you know that? Did you yeah. I, I would see if he would figure it out, but he didn't. He just looked confused when I was like, okay, whatever. And um, painful. And that, and he was just like, oh, well, uh, it's that part of the world. And I'm like, again, what is the relevance here? <laughs> so stupid. Like, what if you met a guy from like. If you were living, like, I don't know, let's say you met a guy that lived on the other side of the country, lived in California, and then you're like, hey, I know someone in Colorado. Like, doesn't even make any sense. <laughs> Such a I, think, so, I, think, I think that's exactly the example you, sh- you should use anytime the guy's just like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. Are you from India? Oh, I went to Thailand. And you're like, What? Yeah. But it's like in that part of the world, right? Right. Uh, you mean Asia? Like the giant, massive oh. continent of Asia? Is that what you mean? Yeah, exactly. It's just so ridiculous. And then it's like, I don't know. And then I, this is actually kind of embarrassing, but because I did. <laughs> I, I, okay, I dated this guy that um, he had a thing for cholas. Like okay. the Mexican, like gangster girls. Got it. With the like lip liner. It's yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I think it's kind of nineties actually. Or oh, it's still like, 90s. yeah, the lip liner's totally nineties. The the tatted eyebrows. Yeah, eyebrows. So he was very into that, and this guy was like as white as white could be. Wow. And he wanted me to dress like a chola. Like he literally said that, and I was like, "Are you?" fucking out of your mind wait in the bedroom or just no like in life in life he wanted me to dress sexy like a chola i'm like okay no one's ever accused me of not being dressing sexy enough anyway like that's not really that's not an issue for me also you know what you're getting into when you're dating anybody so don't tell them i don't know to dress sexier i just think that's ridiculous wow that's uh, that's I, incredible it's stupid because, uh, but also I do. I wear dresses and I wear. You had a chola fetish. Let me understand he, this. He had a chola fetish that he was trying to superimpose onto me, an Indian person who just looks Latina, but it's <laughs> so much wrong going on. Offensive. Well, well, how could you refuse such an incredible offer? How dare you? I know, and I was. I told my like Mexican friends, and they were just like, "Oh God, are you kidding?" They're like. First of all, Achola would never go out with him. They'd rip him a new asshole. And they'd like to spit him up and chew him out. And that's what he was looking for, a new asshole, Rachel. But it, yeah, he probably was. He probably would have liked it. That's where, like, that's where pegging comes in. Uh, but uh, he was probably looking for that. I am always uh, fascinated by... Uh, I, honestly, I'm just at a place in my life where... I have, like, no tolerance for bullshit, like, zero. Like, my tolerance is, like, literally, like, zero fucks are given when I go on dates. Like, zero. Yeah. I don't yeah. care. I uh, went on a date with this guy. He looked nothing like his picture, overweight, dressed like I don't fucking know what. Like, he was, like, the Goodwill, you know, shopping hunter over there. Um, and I showed up and he had already bought us a pizza and I was like, ordered us a pizza. I'm like, why, why would you assume that presum be so presumptuous that I want pizza? I don't want a pizza like with you. And I literally like remember sitting there, I was there for maybe five minutes and the server came over and they're like, would you like something to drink? I'm like, no, and I'm not going to drink or eat anything. Thank you very much. And the server left and I looked at him and I was like, you have wasted my time. I put in all this energy. I got dressed up. I came here. I spent my money, right? You look nothing like your picture. You lied to me. You are absolutely catfishing me right now. And this is disgusting. I'm out. I'm out. I'm fucking out. And I literally just got up and walked out. Good for you. you I, I don't do that, Rachel. I just don't have that kind of patience anymore. I'm not, if you don't look, sound anything like your picture or the way we, you know, we talk, and now you are this fucking monster of a person that has shown up in person. I'm going to be calling your shit out and then I'm going to walk out on you because it's just not fair. You know? Ew. 
How many how many times have you have you been catfished? I've been catfished like twice. I actually have not been catfished, knock on whatever, but I'm very particular about the pictures. I'm very anal about the pictures, I should say. Like I, you know, when they have like multiple sunglass pictures, the pictures look fuzzy, because that means they're old. Um, anything that's like super shady, like you can have one or two of those, but when all of them look old, when all of them have sunglasses. Or, you know, like some people will have like a profile and then they'll have like their dog and a sunset. Yeah. All that is shady, shady, shady. And I'm like, nope, I'm not having any part of this. I want to see a bunch of clear pictures yes. that look recent. Yes. That show what you look like. And if I'm not getting that, it's going to be a swipe left for me. I agree. I, I 100% agree. Now, are you currently dating, Rachel? How, what is What is the dating life for you? I mean, I've heard horror stories in the Bay Area. I know that things are very bad in Los Angeles on the dating end, but I hear in the Bay Area, I don't know where in the Bay Area are you, but I know in San Francisco, well, it's the pandemic too, so that doesn't make dating life so much fun. But I don't know, what is dating life like in Bay Area? Well, it's better than New York, I will say that. Okay. Definitely much better than New York. Um, But yeah, I had a long-term boyfriend actually when I first moved here. Okay. And we broke up. And then, so yeah, and then I dated another guy, um, yeah. but we broke up too. So yeah, I'm out and dating again. Yeah. And what, so what is the difference between the, uh, the Bay Area guys and the New York guys? What's the difference? Uh, there's more of them. So more, uh, more guys in Bay Area? Oh yeah, totally. I mean, you can just tell the difference like immediately. There's just more, there's more, literally more fish in the sea. And um, so that part makes it just a lot more fun. And a lot right, but is it quality or is it just quantity? Oh, I mean, quality, I don't know. But quantity, yeah. I mean, I think, yeah, there's, def- there's definitely more quantity. Quality, let me think about that. I mean, this is the thing. At the end of the day, you bring yourself with you. So you're. it's not like I'm dating a different type of person. Uh-huh. You know what I mean? In the Bay Area versus New York. I'm just dating more of them. Or I see more of them. There's, there's like I remember in New York swiping and just being like, "Fuck, like this is bad." Like, oh, New York was horrible. I I grew up in New York City. Uh, the dating there scene is just horrific. But then I came to LA and I was like, "Wow, it made the New York scene look really good." Uh, because I can't imagine LA is good. That sounds terrible. LA is. Um, I always make this joke on stage. Uh, dating in Los Angeles is like going through the clearance section at the 99 cent store because that's literally what it feels like here. Yeah. It is the bottom of the fucking barrel. Yeah. I mean, I've had friends that have met guys in New York and I've had friends that met guys in LA. So, I mean, they're out there. Um, But... On Charlie.com, apparently. Oh God, I would never do that. Or like Muzmatch, which is, or or, or uh, Minder, which is the Muslim Tinder, believe it or not, Rachel. I've heard of Minder. Have you done that? I I got off of it as quickly as I got on it. I okay. uh, deleted it very quickly. A uh, lot of very weird looking people on there. Some people are totally there for the fetish. You can just tell. They're like, ooh, Muslim. Mm, is she going to oh. come? Is she going to come in a burqa and like ask me to terrorize her? What's going to oh happen? Is she going to, is she going to terrorize my dick? What's she going to do? Huh? And it's like, Oh shit. No, I'm out. I'm out. Yeah. I'm so out. I, I can't be a part of this. I cannot be sure. a part of this fucking nonsense. Yeah. Mender is uh Minder is something else. What, what now you're, you're a, a sex writer uh, and uh you know, uh, somebody of South Asian said, we don't have a lot of you. Uh, it would be nice to have more of you guys because we need to have these conversations a lot more openly uh, and be a lot more frank about them. Um, are you like, do you get approached by folks in India who are just like, hey, we want you to come and, you know, be a sex blogger here and talk about this? Like, what is what is that like? I don't know. Like, how do how do Indian guys see you? And we're like, oh my god, you're a sex writer. Uh, I'm not so sure if I want to go out with you. Yeah, I mean, I don't really go out with a lot of Indian guys. A lot. I mean, that being one of the reasons, but just in general, I'm definitely more. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? I'm more out there than your traditional. Yes. Indian person. I'm not going to say woman, but person in general. Sure. Um, 
you know, and so most Indian guys I find are traditional. Now, if I could be an Indian guy that was a little more on the liberal kind of more like me side, yeah. I'd be that. But most of the Indian guys I encounter are more traditional. And I'm like, I am not going to partake in any of that. And they're freak. They'd be freaked out about the sex writing thing. I met some. They are. Um, so I'm not. So they freaked out. Wait, the some that you met at one on day. Did they freak out about the fact that you're a sex writer? Yeah, they did. Well, I mean, they weren't. They weren't like yelling at me. It wasn't anything like that. It was just kind of like a, oh, oh, you know. And I could just tell from the way they spoke about their families and stuff that they were like not be into yeah. that. Yes. Yeah. I did go out actually with this one Indian guy that I was like, oh, this guy's different. Like, he's cool. Like, this is going to be a good day. I'm like, oh my God. I'm like, what if I end up with an Indian guy? I was like, totally into it. I, first of all, within the first 20 minutes, he told me he didn't like gays. And whoa, whoa, whoa. I just came out and said he did not like gay people. Whoa. We we're in New York. And I'm like, you know, we live in New York, right? Like, what the fuck is wrong with you? I was just like, what wow. is wrong? Wow, wow. And I just come out and just say it. Homophobic, <laughs> straight up homophobic. Okay. Straight up homophobic. So I'm like, all right, I'm already in my head like, well, this isn't going to go anywhere. And sure. then um, and then he, I'm not even shitting you. He licked my neck within like 20 minutes. Ew. This is a guy I met in person. This is not a guy I met online. What do you mean licked your neck? Like grabbed you and licked your neck? So, like literally leaned over and was like, Ew. What are you doing? I was like, what are you doing? I was like, I gotta go. And I had like a glass of rose, and I remember I was just like like trying to chug it. And he was like, You can come back to my place. And I was like, I've got my period. And he's like, I don't care. And I was like, Oh my God, what do you not understand about any of this? I'm like, you're homophobic, you're licking my neck, you you are inviting me back to your apartment when I like, and I'm pretending that I have my period just to freak you out. I mean, all of it was just a mess. And I I really felt like when I met him, he was like very measured and calm and normal and he wasn't flying the freak flag he was keeping yeah. it down oh and he actually like, tried to pursue me like for a while after that and then i started dating somebody seriously but i was just like what i can't believe i went out with an indian guy that i actually thought could be a good fit and then um it didn't work out and then you want to know something funny um <laughs> do you um do you know that guy He's a correspondent on Vice TV. No. Okay, there's this cute Indian guy, a correspondent on Vice TV. And like, okay. I tried to like interview him for something once. Like I tried to like wiggle my way into interviewing him for something once and thinking like, well, maybe if he met me, <laughs> he fall in love. Like I'm not gonna do, I'm not gonna be inappropriate. Yeah. Cause I, pe people have done that to me where they use professional ways to be inappropriate. I'm like, I'm not gonna do that, but I'm legitimately gonna interview him yeah he happens to fall in love with me then that just happens to happen <laughs> like, it's just in the stars what can i say yeah, exactly and I, I was totally like see this guy's my type he's so cool he's like a correspondent for vice like you yeah. know he's not typical like doctor or anything he's not you know he's i felt like kind of like indian kind of guy i would be into right um but and we were actually gonna do an interview but he only wanted to do it over the phone and i was like he's not gonna fall in love with me over the phone <laughs> Now I'm just like, uh and then he asked because like something came up, so we never ended up doing it. And I was just like, Aw. Well, but now's your chance, Rachel. You can like zoom call him because he has no choice but to zoom call you. It's the middle of a freaking pandemic. That's true. Now everyone's zooming, so it's a little bit different. But yeah, I don't know. Maybe you're like, he's just I gonna fall, he's gonna hear my voice and be like, You are the love of my life. I know. He's like, I've been waiting for you. I've been waiting for my Indian female counterpart, and here you are. Rachel, let me tell you something. Um, because of this pandemic, I'm not even wasting any more time. Next date I go on, I'm showing up in a wedding gown, okay? And if it <laughs> makes him nervous, then he's not the fucking one. He okay? is not he's the fucking not one. The one. I feel I'm, like it's probably a reality show or something. Yeah, I'm coming in in a full-blown wedding gown, uh, bringing flowers with me, and he's like, what's going on? I'm like, I just want to know what your commitment level is. I just want to know if this is going to go anywhere. And if this makes you nervous, sir, then there is the door. Um, don't forget to, and uh, I will invoice you for the tab that you just stuck me with. So That's right. I will, I will say, no, no, I've, I've definitely had uh, my fair share of encounters of uh, really horrific dating. Um, 
I uh, went out with a guy here that, uh, you know, I was talking to him. He's an Italian guy from New York. And I was like, ah, oh, we're fellow New Yorkers, paisan. We're talking, having a good time, shooting the shit. And he was like, let's go. Let's meet for dinner. I'm like, cool. Awesome. Uh, we meet here in L.A., not far from where I live. And I'm waiting in the parking lot for him. And I turn around and I see a very large man. Not like the man I saw in the picture, which the picture was a little bit old. And I had to learn that the hard way. This guy was at least 200 pounds overweight from his picture. I oh should know. Yes. Yes. So the catfishing. This is one of the catfishing. That's major catfishing. It's major catfishing. And I was like, oh, my God. If I turn around and walk away, I'm going to be the asshole. So, And then he's like, Mona. I'm like, oh, fuck. He saw me. So, and then we was like, hey, bud, what's happening? He was like, let's go to dinner. I'm like, let's skip dinner. How about that? Maybe we can just skip it all together. Uh, and then we sat down and he was like, so I'm like, can I ask you something? How old is that picture of yours? And he goes, oh, it's only a year old. I'm like, so you're telling me in one year you put on over 100, 150 pounds. He's like, yeah, my weight fluctuates a great deal. And I'm like, no. That's not possible. That's literally not possible, sir. Like, what are you talking about? And then I later found out that he was lying to me. He has three different kids from three different women. Oh, come on, dude. Yes. Yes. Now, then he's like, I'm a producer. I have this project coming out, and you'd be really good for this. And I'm like, listen, thank That's you so cool. much. Thanks you so much. But, um, I'm going to, I'm going to go. Uh, I'm really just, I'm actually going to run is what the fuck I'm going to do. I'm not even going to go. I'm going to run the hell out of here. But I mean, dating is just so difficult. I mean, I think, I think our generation and especially coming from the background that we do, we, our mothers didn't sit us down and be like, okay, so when you date a man, there was no fucking conversation. We have to go out there each yeah. in real time. Keep falling on our face. Keep meeting these weirdos. Try to navigate between, you know, coming from a certain culture and then trying to, like, blend in and then, you know, surviving the culture that we do uh, while trying to hold on to our values and our culture and try to date in the meantime while simultaneously wanting to please our parents because nothing is ever good enough for them. It's exhausting. Yeah, you nailed it on the head. It's like, that's a lot all at once, all together. And yeah, nothing is ever good enough. Nothing's ever good enough. It's freaking exhausting. It's like you're always are on. Like I always feel myself on. Like at night, I'm just like I'm gone. I'm like I just collapse because it's exhausting. It's just constantly exhausting. And even though you don't live with your parents or you don't live around them, like the subconscious conditioning of what you grow up with is always there with you. And even though, you know, as an adult, you're like, try to be more mindful. You try to undo all those things. You, uh, as I like to call it, you try to unfuck yourself. But there are so, there is so much unfucking that needs to be done. It's fucking exhausting, you know? So yeah. what, what are your, some of your kind of ways, Rachel, of how, how you kind of navigate the dating world? Like, is your family like, Rachel, let's just take you to India, find you a nice Indian boy? No, wait, they're not that conservative, thank God. Thank God. So then, they're not like, hey, find a nice Indian guy. None of that. They're like, just be happy. Find a nice guy and be happy. Well, this, yeah, they're like, just find somebody. Just find a guy. And, now, and do you have siblings or are you the only child? I have a sister and she's married. Um, so, yeah, I think they, uh, no, they've never been like, find an Indian guy. Like, they're, they're a lot more liberal than that. Okay. Uh, I think because they grew up in Bombay. They're okay. Not, they're not that conservative as far as Indians go. I mean, compared to average american yes they're more conservative right but compared to although actually now as they've gotten older they've become way more liberal and i don't know if it's because my sister and i have just dragged them kicking and screaming because yeah. neither one of us really like she's not like she got covered in tattoos when she was in college and got oh. a lip ring yeah so we both you know went the other way so i think they've sure. had to adjust because of that sure so they're wait. Did but, you marry an Indian guy or no? No. What did, he, what did she marry? Well, okay. He actually he's he looks he's white. He looks white for all intents and purposes. But he actually is only half white, and then the and then he has a quarter Indian and a quarter black. Oh wow! But he looks white. He he acts like a white dude. I mean, I 
whatever that means. I don't even know what that means. Well, in the sense of like, you know, he does a lot of the mansplaining. He, uh, oh wow, he's yeah. a mansplainer. Okay. Yeah, I mean, he he's not scared of getting pulled over by the cops or anything like that, you know. And right. so he looks white, um, but he does love he loves to mansplain. Um, I mean, I've never had I've never been mansplained by a man of color. I'll say that it's only been white men. So oh, interesting. No, it's the it, I, I've been mansplained by pretty much any ethnicity you can. Think. Oh, okay, good to know. Yeah, good. yeah, I've been mansplained yeah. by everybody. Yeah, I've oh. been mansplained by multiple. Uh, multiple ethnicities, uh, mostly by, I recently had a guy came and comment on my YouTube channel that uh, he asked me if I was even Muslim. He questioned my faith. He said that you do not uh, act or talk or behave like a Muslim woman. And I was like, I don't know what the fuck that means. I don't know what that means. I mean, it's a, it's a form of control. It's a uh, Pakistani men, especially the ones in Pakistan have this uh, sense of entitlement to them which uh, nobody has ever, ever checked them or fucking just come down on them or have any repercussions. They always feel very entitled to your body, very entitled to tell you what your faith should be, how you should behave, how you should dress, how you should talk. Uh, And somebody really needs to take a giant bat and just hit them over the head with it and be like, shut the fuck up. Like, no woman has asked for your opinion. Shut the fuck up, right? And yeah. this guy was literally arguing with me about how Muslim I really am and how Muslim uh, I need to be and how much I need to follow my faith. And I was just like, I was like, have you ever, uh, in America, we have this term called kill yourself. And I was like, that is what I would recommend for you. I was <laughs> like, because the fact that you feel that you have the audacity to go and tell a strange woman that you've never met, uh, which would be me, uh, and I was like, I bet you go around telling this to women, don't you? Because this makes you feel like a big man. It makes you feel like I'm doing the, I'm the good Muslim for doing that. I was like, it actually makes you a fucking douchebag is what it makes you. So I was like, stop doing that. Well, that's the thing. It's like anytime someone has to go and do that, they're just making themselves look small. They're not really like, they're doing it because they feel small, but trying to feel bigger. You know, it's like the little dog and the big dog. Like, yeah. Little- barking the big dog is like whatever i'm chill because i'm I'm the big dog so if you're going around doing that you're just a little dog like you don't you don't look stronger you don't look you, you just seem like a guy is probably not getting laid and just miserable and uh, you know don't have a whole lot to, going on like look if you had your shit together yes. you got her together and you have social skills and you can meet women and whatever and you have friends you're not sitting there arguing with random women on the internet and telling them what to do. Like that's, that says a lot more about the other person, I think, than. Well, you know, I don't know if you recently heard, there's this uh, Turkish play, uh, this Turkish uh, drama series, and they've been uh, playing it in uh, on Pakistani television network in Pakistan. And it's like the number one watch show there, right? They dub it in Urdu and it's a number one watch show. And the actress who was one of the lead actresses, she's Turkish, right? She's Turkish. She's a gorgeous woman. And, um, you know, she plays like this conservative role on screen. Now off screen, she's like this super liberal, like wears her dresses and her skirts and her bikinis. Like she lives in Turkey. Like that's just the lifestyle she has. And these Pakistani guys went on social media and ganged up on her and was just like, we want you to get fired because you're not Muslim. You're not behaving like a Muslim woman. You're behaving, you're dressing up in like a provocative way. And that is not the character you are portraying on screen. And we are appalled that the, how could you ever dress that way? And it's just like, she's a fucking actress. Like that's her job. Like what? What are you talking about? But this is the mentality that we're fighting. We're fighting this mentality of, and by the way, those guys are in America too, right? They they live here. They've been here for multiple years. They might even be born and raised here. Uh, And they have, they carry those same sentiments and that same mentality of telling a woman that you can do this, you can't do that, when they have absolutely no claim or no right to do so. See, that's interesting. I mean, how... I, what's interesting is I'm wondering how did that, how did this happen? First of all, number one, and I and the other thing oh, that misogyny happened is that what you mean? No, but like specifically in in South Asian culture, I'm just kind of like, how did it get this bad? I mean, not that like 
I know why, Rachel. I have an idea. I have a theory on it. Because it wasn't. It was. There was times where it wasn't as bad, and I feel like it's gotten worse. Or maybe it's just my perception of things. But it's well, worse. it's always been pretty fucking bad. Uh, it's always been. Well, it's always been bad, but I don't know. It just seems like okay. Like I'll uh, an example I would use is like if you look at, and I wasn't there, but pictures of Afghanistan from the 1960s. Like the women yes. are wearing mini skirts. Yes. You know they're walking around. They're going to university. Yes. It's like. What happened? Like, how did it become? I mean, there's all sorts of stuff. Socialism Extremism happened is what happened, right? Yeah. And, um, you the know. Mullahs, the mullahs came and took over. Just like the mullahs have came, come and taken over in Pakistan and have a great say in the government and they have a great say in the policy making is the same bullshit that happened. Taliban coming and taking over in Afghanistan. And now they are in the mess that they are. It's a totally, like, backwards, like, you know, uh, country, sadly, mainly because. The, the, the Taliban hand, the mullahs have single-handedly destroyed that country. And, and the same is happening to Pakistan as we speak. You know, every time Saudi Arabia goes to Pakistan and drops a check, right? They're just like, uh-huh. oh, you want some money? Here's a check. But when we drop you the check, yeah. you have to you have to have more stricter blasphemy laws. We want you to up the madrasas where the more the Quranic, the more extreme, the more Wahhabism mentality is, you know, an ideology is being taught to younger, poorer kids. Like everything just gets more conservative. Every time Saudi Arabia goes to Pakistan and drops a check, that is exactly what they demand, you know? Well, and see, Pakistan, sorry. Oh, no, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I, mean, I think that's the interesting part. Yeah. Like your average American doesn't know is that, you know, your average American is just like, Muslim terrorism, you know, blah, blah, blah. But I'm like, there's a whole series of like political things that are happening. That's right. That are causing it more than the fact that like Muslim people are bad. Like America is hand in hand with Saudi Arabia. We know we're totally in bed together. That's right. And then they're, we're giving them money and then they're taking money and they're the ones that started. How do you say it? Wahhabism? Wahhabism. Yep, that you got it. Well, he's spreading all of this, and they have all the money, and they are the ones encouraging all of this to happen. So it's yep. it's we're connected to it. We're all it's all one big connection, and and that's we, what I think is like very frustrating. Is like right. I'm like, oh my god, there it's more it's more than just like you know the simplicity of like well all people are Muslim or terrorists. No, it's very political. It's, it's incredibly political. It's nothing but political, Rachel. It, it, you know, religion is just the facade to use to control people. Like, and, and the bottom line is about power and control and money, right? The only reason uh, we are in bed with Saudi Arabia is because of access to oil. Now, we have a larger reserve of oil than anybody in the world. America holds the largest access to oil than anybody in the world. Do you think that was by accident? No, that was absolutely part of the strategy of the of our part of our foreign policy of going and extracting resources and bring them back and holding on to them. And the reason we we are in bed with Saudi Arabia is because of their resources. The the day they run out of oil, so God help Saudi Arabia, they are fucked. We will drop them like a fucking hotcake. Because they mean sure. nothing to us besides that. And the only reason we back them uh, because of the war that's happening in Yemen, which is by caused by Saudi Arabia, there's a full-blown famine happening in Yemen. People are being murdered and executed because they're Shias and Saudis are Sunnis. And they are just like, yo, annihilate these Shias. Get rid of them. Right? And that's what they're doing. So, sorry. I can go on this for, like, hours because I cannot stand the Saudi government. I cannot stand the Saudi government. It, they're awful and annoying. And I think the other thing that when you're talking about, like, the the misogyny is that, you know, I've actually tried to talk about this with, like, white friends. And white liberals get very, like, freaked out when you bring this up because they don't want to seem racist. And so... At least that's the, you know, the kind of impression I've got, like, you know, yeah. you can't say there's misogyny um, in that, those parts of the world. And I'm like, but there are women that are fighting to get out of it. Like, there right. are women who are fighting, like, women in Saudi Arabia are fighting to dry. Like, you, I'm almost like, but you're not supporting them. You know that's what I mean? That's like, right. Support those women. Yes. Give, give, give them the power. Like, go sign a petition for them and, like, blah, blah, blah. But, like, to pretend that there isn't misogyny because you don't want to seem racist is like insane to me. Like that's well, what. I- but here's the thing, Rachel. Just to like to to kind of look at it from the uh, from the white people side, it's just like you know, it's like damn if you do, damn if you don't, 
right? Sure. Sometimes, sometimes they're put in these positions where, you know, a white person will come out and be like, there's a lot of fucking misogyny in Middle East and South Asia. And some person, some man or woman be like, that's racist. You can't make that claim. Yeah. And it's like, and then somebody like me would get up and be like, no, brown person, shut the fuck up. They are right. There is a lot of misogyny in Saudi Arabia, you know, in, in the Middle East of South Asia, right? And then th- there's a big argument. Oh, no. Well, if they criticize them, they're racist. No, they're not. They just yeah. simply make the, num- the power, pr- the proof is in the pudding. Look at the numbers. Yeah. yeah. You know? Look, um, misogyny is really bad in America, too. We have three women that die every single day at the hands of their significant other. That is a hard number. No, three people. You would not hear this in the news. You wouldn't hear any, anything unless they have gone missing for a while along with their children. And you're like, oh, my God. Like, have you heard of this guy named Watts, the Watts family? Have you heard about their case? No. This guy named Watts had a wife and two kids she was pregnant with the third child okay and she was suspecting that he was having an affair what she didn't suspect is that he was having an affair with a young guy not a woman okay now one morning this what fucker got up and he said to himself you know what would make life so much easier if all my entire family disappears that would make my life so much easier So he got on top of his pregnant wife and he strangled her to death while she's pregnant with their baby. Okay. Of course the baby dies. Then he goes into the little girl's room, the two daughters that he has, and he picks them one by one and he murders them right, right in the room. Then he takes their bodies. Okay. Waits till the night falls, drags their bodies into the back of his car. And one of the female neighbors watches him as he's dragging these bodies out right in these body bags. So she's like, something's wrong. I haven't seen the wife and I haven't seen the kids. Something is wrong, right? Then he comes on and then makes a report and says, oh my God, my family has gone missing. I don't know where they are, this and that. And then, of course, the police come, the detectives go around questioning. And this woman says, no, she calls the cops and she's like, I saw this motherfucker take some body, some, some things, very heavy duty things out. Go check his, you know, wherever the fuck he buried his butt. And then he re- came out and confessed. He's like, yep, I'm gay. Uh, and I've been in the closet and I was having an affair with this man. Uh, and I wanted to get rid of my wife and my kids. So I murdered them. I find this story so interesting. Like, that that's like the first thought. You know, I don't want to be with this person anymore. Murder. Murder is what I'm going to do. Like, well, how is that the first thing that comes to your mind? Like, how is that the easier option? Is How is the easier option not divorce, breakup? I, I, I don't understand. That's like. I just don't understand. I'm sorry. Women don't do that shit. We, if we want, want to be with a guy, we're just like, look, I don't want to be with you. I'm just going to go be with somebody else. I'm not going to get up and like murder. It's not to say that they don't do shit like that. Remember Casey Anthony? Yeah. That straight up murdered her daughter and then went clubbing. So that's we have that. Artem, I guess. I think that's like a little, I think, I don't know. I don't, I don't remember, but, um. Well, she had postpartum, but she also had the clubbings uh, because she wanted to go clubbing afterwards. She was just like, if I can well, only- <laughs> Yeah, find a way to get rid of this little girl. Life will be so much better. Um, up again. She needs to get her serotonin up, I guess, after like killing her kid. I don't know. Like, it's so crazy. Like, I get, I get. Murder is not the easier option. It is not. It is the farthest thing from the easier option. It actually um, is really hard to do and messy. Unless you're in Pakistan, then you can have money and get yourself paid off. But that's a different story. <laughs> story that's disturbing well rachel what uh what we're gonna start wrapping up so what uh, what are you working on do you have any pieces coming out because of the pandemic or is there anything that you're focused on in writing um let's see i just want to take a moment to say your hair looks amazing oh well thank you thank you i always get compliments on my hair but thank you um let's see what am i working on i am actually working on a story um I'm like, how much should I say about it? It's an astrology related story. Okay. And um, it's going to be coming out in the next few weeks. And I'll, okay. and it's for a publication I've ever written for before. So, a very popular publication? Yeah, pre- a very popular one. Okay. It also, awesome. like, doesn't like to say a lot until it's like out. You know what I mean? Okay. So, Thinks it. But, um, awesome. But, um, I interviewed someone for it today and I interviewed another person the week before. And so it's astrology related. It's going to be really fun. It's going to be something people might be interested in because of COVID. Yeah. Um, 
So yeah, I'm excited for that to come out. And when is it coming out? You said in a couple of weeks? I think in a couple of weeks because I have to turn it in. Okay. Tuesday, so. And and so where can people follow you, Rachel? Um, so my Instagram is just my name, Rachel Kona, and then um my business Instagram is in my bio, so they can follow that too if they want, which is Crimson and Clover underscore studio. But Go to Rachel Kona, and then it's all there. All right, fabulous, Rachel. This was a lot of fun. Thank you so much for coming on. This was this was fun. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, have a great weekend, great Labor Day weekend. I will see you soon. Okay, see you soon. Thank you. Bye. That was Rachel Kona. I hope you guys had enjoyed that conversation. I did. Uh, talks about a lot of things. Definitely get. I always end up somehow talking about uh, political stuff because mainly because I've become very passionate about it more recently than ever before. But you guys, if you haven't subscribed to my YouTube channel, please do. It would mean the world to me. Uh, if you want to share this, you can check out the playlist, my stand up, my, my, all my stand up playlists are on my YouTube. Uh, that stuff is not anywhere else. It is strictly on my YouTube channel. You can check out my minority report podcast with bunch of celebrities and change makers and actors and comedians uh you can check that out uh and there's a bunch of other you know uh videos i have i my appearances on the young turks my appearance on nbc blah 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 bunch of stuff if you subscribe to my youtube channel you will see it all there you guys have a lovely lovely and safe labor day weekend i will see you guys on monday with a brand new guest have a lovely evening good night